Right. Well, hello and welcome to this talk about point-free programming in JavaScript. My name is Damian, and I'll be entertaining you in the next hour with this um, mini mini workshop on point-free programming. Um, a little bit about me. I run a small London-based consultancy that helps people build better software by providing training and consulting services. And we mostly focus around web technologies. So I'd like to start with a little bit of history. Uh, because today is the year 2019, and it is a 100-year anniversary of a foundation of Bauhaus, which was founded by this fella, this guy, Walter Gropius, in Germany, in 1919. So it was just after the World War I. And it's really interesting how it all came to be, because it all started when he asked himself a question. Is it possible to build beautiful things without ornaments? Uh, can you make things intrinsically beautiful without actually having beauty as the add-on, something that you just slap on later? And um, this is also similar with this other movement called New Objectivity, where the idea was to try and build nice things for as many people as possible. And they realized that basically the only way to do that is to have reusable parts, like lots of lots of reusable parts, and then um, you can scale this thing and, and build uh, uh, a lot of things and make a lot of people happy. Um, and we'll actually come back to this idea of reusable parts or molecules and, and, and how we build things from smaller, from smaller things. So this is an important idea. And I'll also give you another example of this approach, where you basically put certain limitation in place, and then that forces you to find new ways of doing things and new, explore new ways of, of thinking. Um, it's, a, it's about a jazz concert by Keith Jarrett, and it's called The Köln Co Concert, or Cologne, as they would say in English. And what's really interesting about this concert is that um, there was a little bit of misunderstanding between the concert organizers and, and, and Keith. And basically what happened is they ordered the wrong piano. And the piano that was delivered to the concert hall was out of tune and much smaller than a proper grand piano. And they spent hours and hours trying to kind of um, tune it and make it work, but to no avail. And he nearly rejected to perform, but a German lady who was a concert organizer managed to convince him that he should actually actually do it. And the problem with piano was that it was only the sort of middle register that was working correctly. The, the, the highs were pretty much non-existent and the lows were also very, very weak. So um, basically he could only play with half, half the piano, which is a massive, massive limitation. Um, what happened is this became um, the most sold piano concert record in the history of music and also the most sold jazz album in the history of music. Uh, because he had to improvise and improvise in such a way that, that basically to hide the deficiency of the instrument that he was, he was playing. And this is a really interesting idea of how you can discover new things. You basically put a certain limitation in place and then try and do things um, in different ways and see what do, you, what do you uncover. Sometimes that's useful, sometimes, sometimes it's not. But it's actually the process of discovery that makes the whole thing interesting. So, we can try and do the same thing with any sort of programming language, including JavaScript. So, one of the things we could try, we could go the same way as, as Keith did and say, well, can I actually write programs with a broken keyboard? Yeah. Um, which is not a very useful enterprise, unless you obviously use one of the new Apple laptops, which um, are so prone to breaking, breaking keys. Um, and it turns out that this is actually possible. Again, it might, might not be the most useful, useful thing, but it is actually possible. It turns out you can write any JavaScript program by only using six different characters. Okay? 
And the, all, the only characters you need are open and closed bracket, open and closed square bracket, the plus symbol, and the exclamation mark. And any kind of JavaScript program can be built by only using these six, six characters. So I'm actually going to show you um, um, a beauty. Anyone has an idea what this JavaScript program does? Well, it's a bit hard to tell from, from this, but let's, let's try and run it in the Chrome DevTools and see, see what happens. So I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger and paste that thing in. And then when you run it, you actually get a perfectly working implementation of the FizzBuzz, yeah? which is amazing. Um, so basically, next time when you're interviewing and someone asks you, you know, what are your biggest strengths? You know, don't go, I can perform under pressure, or Bohemian Rhapsody, or whatever. Um, you can say, I can write any JavaScript program by only using six characters. Yeah, and it's instant hire, 100%, 100%. Um, so that's, that's one, one thing we might try. I'll give you some other, some other ideas. So another thing we could possibly try is to build programs, any kind of programs, by only using anonymous functions. So basically, don't use numbers, don't use booleans, don't use for loops, if statements, switch statements, nothing. You're only allowed to use anonymous functions and see what do you sort of uncover or, or discover in, in the process. And if you're really kind of lucky or smart, you'll discover something called lambda, lambda calculus. So it is possible to write any program by only using anonymous, anonymous functions. Um, or you can ask yourself, how do I build programs without null checks? How do I program without nulls? Or how can I build stuff by not having any side effects in my, in my code? Obviously, some of these things are not possible because you, in order to do anything useful, you have to have side effects. But you can then say, well, that's fine, but how about if I minimize the amount of code that is performing side effects and try and do as much as possible by having code that has no visible no visible side effects. And then if you are lucky, you might discover something called monad or, or um, category theory or algebra. Uh, but today, we'll try a different idea. We'll try a different thing. So the question is, or the question that we would like to ask is, what would programming in JavaScript look like if you were not allowed to use the function keyword? So basically, you're not allowed to ever use either the function key keyword or use the fat arrow, which is basically just a way of cheating uh, um, and having functions with without having the, the function keyword. And that's exactly what a point-free style programming is. So it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit of fancy name because mathematicians call things in a different way. So point is actually the argument. So basically, point-free means without naming the argument, functions without without arguments. So the idea is, can we build functions by only applying other functions and, and, and combining some existing, existing functions? So for example, this, these two functions, which both do the same thing, one is, is built using normal functions, the other one is using fat arrows, they are not point-free because um, they both have two points. So this function here has one point called people, and this function here has one point called person. So this is not what, what we're after, but we would like to be able to build this same program or algorithm, but without ever using the function, the function keyword. Uh, and the same happens here. So the only difference is we're not using the function keyword, but we use the fat arrows. And we have one point called PS, which is um, people. And we have another point called P, or parameter, or argument. Um, in this inner, inner function here. So this is not what we're after. What we're after is something like this. So basically, if you inspect this bit of code, you'll notice that at no point in time we either have a function keyword or a fat, fat error. So to start with this, let's, let's create like a concrete problem that we, we want to solve. And the problem is, Given an array of people, 
that have names and ages and accounts with balances, we would like to find the total amount that is owed by all the adults in this array, which in this concrete example should be six, because it, the only adults that owe money are Bob and Dan, and they owe six of something uh, together. All right. So we can obviously solve this in a pointful way, with points. And one way to do this would be to have this function that takes one parameter, or point, people, and then it starts with zero as the result and iterates through this array, and if the person is over 18 and is in debt, then we subtract the balance from the result and finally return, return the result. And this would indeed give us number six as a result. Or if you're kind of more functionally inclined, you can do this by first filtering out the people that are adults um, by using the filter method on the array and then filtering the ones that are in debt and then mapping and finding their balances and then reducing this to a number by subtracting the debt from, from, this, from this accumulator. So either of these two works. The first one has one point, people, whereas this program here has actually four or five different points. We have one called person, another one called person, and another one called person. Uh, actually, we have the people as well, and we have the account and the balance. So this one is even worse in terms of how many points, how many points it has. Right, so this is what we are aiming for. We will try and re-implement these functions, but without ever using the function keyword. Right. So how do we do this? How do we solve this problem? Well, it's a really big problem to solve, and generally um, you have to have some sort of strategy as to how you solve problems. And, and my favorite one is when you have a big problem to solve, which you don't know how to solve, then you make a much smaller problem that kind of resembles the original one, but it's, it's simpler and smaller. So maybe when you solve the simpler one, you learn from that and then go on and, 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 and do bigger, bigger things. So the simple problem that we'll solve is how to implement a function like this one, point three. It's a really, really simple problem. We, you're given a person and you want to find out what his age is, and you have this fat arrow function that just retrieves, retrieves a property called age, um, and we want to do this point three. And the way we'll do this is by blatantly cheating, okay? Which is also another good strategy. Like when you don't know how to solve the problem, you cheat. Yeah? So we'll create this point three collection of molecules. These reusable are bits and pieces and components, because obviously we don't know how to, how to do this, but then we'll reframe the problem and say, well, I can't do it but without using any functions, but maybe I can create some functions and have a, a collection of reusable functions that are not point three, because JavaScript as a language is not designed to be as such. But then, when I create this set of molecules, then from that point on, I'll be able to implement everything point three. And this is what we do. So we create this three point collection of functions and add the get age function here because we don't know how can we do it. And then we implement our get age, original get age function by saying I take the person and do fp.age and pass the person. And that would give me the property called age of this person. And every time you build a function like this one, a kitten dies. It's a scientifically proven fact. Yeah? So every time you build a function like that, a kitten dies. Why? Well, because let's look at what this function here does. Let's try and decipher what's going on here. So it's a function that takes one parameter called person, and it then applies another function called fp.getAge by passing that person as a parameter, capturing the result, and then returning exactly the same value as fp.getAge returns. Yeah? And that's a really, really pointless thing because our getAge function would always return exactly the same result if we pass the same parameter as the function called fp.getAge, which means that we can reduce this to just this. We can say getAge is equal to fp.getAge. We can 
get rid of the person and the arrow and this person here, because these, these two functions are indistinguishable from one, from one another. When you call them with same parameters, you would always get the same, the same result. And this is our first discovery, our first rule that we've uncovered. It's, it's, a, it's a way of eliminating the pointless code, basically removing the functions that do nothing. So here we have a function called f that takes x and does some computation. And then we have a function called g that takes x and just invokes f with an x and returns the same result. And again, another kitten dies because this function g is equal to the function f. Yeah, for all intents and purposes, the two are exactly the same, exactly the same function. Right. So the rule we came up with is that this expression here, x arrow f applied onto x, can always mechanically be replaced by just f. And it's a really, really important rule. Yeah? It's, it's, it's trivially simple rule, but it's really, really an important one. So this is sort of one way how we can remove arrows from our functions or our function keywords, but basically just use other, other functions. And this is called eta, eta conversion. If you um, know lambda calculus, this is one of the transformations um, in, in inside the, the lambda that you can do in inside the lambda, lambda calculus. Um, there are actually examples when, when, when you want to do it the other way around, but that's a topic for a completely different different talk. Anyway, and what's really surprising about this occurrence is that it actually happens a lot. Like if you were to go around and check the code on GitHub, like randomly open sourced files on, on GitHub, this happens a lot, like this, this kind of problem. So I'll give you one example. I, I, I found this bit of code when I was playing with some hooks library. It's a kind of new fashionable um, thing in the React community. Um, and now lots of reusable hooks libraries are, are popping up. And one of them has this hook or a function called use mount, which is implemented like, like this. I simplify things a little bit uh, by only removing import and export, the stuff that we don't care about. But this is basically what the use mount function does and how it's, how it's implemented. And then when we look at this, we can now search for these reductions that we can perform mechanically. And we need look no further than here, because this is exactly the same scenario that we have on a previous slide. We have a function that, in this case, takes no parameters, and then invokes another function, and also passes no parameters, and returns the same result, which means that we can reduce this to just that. So use mount fn, and then use effect fn. But we don't stop here. So now we look into this. We can perform another reduction, because this expression here is exactly the same thing. Uh, we take, it's a function that takes a parameter and then invokes another function by passing that same parameter and returning the same result. Which means that we can simplify this even further to just that, which then begs the question, well, do you actually need these two hooks because they do always exactly the same thing? It's just a different name for the same, for the same thing. And um, once you internalize this idea, you, you're, you're going to start seeing this a lot everywhere. Yeah, so, you know, save the kittens, don't do that. Do the eta, eta conversion. Okay, so now we can go back to our problem. And we can say, well, age is fine. What if I want to retrieve a property called balance? Well, I also don't know how to do that, so I'm going to add that function to my um, point free, free point library. But this then becomes a little bit nasty, because this means that we're just going to carry on cheating and, and keep adding new functions every time we want to retrieve a different property. But what we developers are really good at, we're really good at spotting patterns and automating things. So what we can do here is we can say, well, how about we create a function that can automatically create exactly these type of functions that, that we need, like a factory. So, so I don't have to add a new one every time. I actually have a means of creating new ones every time I need one. And that's exactly what happens here. We create this function called pick that takes the name of the property that we want to retrieve and then returns a function that would always return 
the value of the property with that name for whichever object you pass in as a, as a parameter. And then we can say get age is fp pick age and get balance is fp pick balance, which is a lot better because now we have only one molecule called pick. And by using that molecule, by just applying it, we can create a function that can retrieve any property from any object we want. So that's a, that's a progress. That's good. Um, <clears throat> and now just one more time. Um, don't use fp.pick like this because the kitten dies. Um, perform the eta reduction. When you do it, you're just going to get back to uh, this exact previous, previous solution. So um, the idea here is that this whole thing here is a function. So if you abstract away how that function is implemented, what it does, um, it's exactly the same shape of that reduction rule that we have seen, seen before. Right. So we can now just change this slightly, because first of all, it's silly to call this person or account, because this can really be anything. This was only during this refactoring step. And we can also just use fat arrows. We don't have to use functions. It's a slightly more idiomatic um, way of doing things. So now we have this pick function, which has two of these arrows here. First, it gets the property name. Then it gets the object. And then you get the value of a property with that name from that object. And then we can create get age and get balance. And this is our first discovery. We've, we've literally just now discovered something called curried functions. They're basically functions that always take one parameter at a time. And this was really a necessary discovery, because without this, we won't be able um, to have a single function that would allow us to retrieve any property from any, any given object in a point-free point style. So if we want to get name, we do pick name and then pass the person, and we indeed would get the name of that, of that person. And this is really interesting if you kind of look at this sort of philosophically, because how do you do this in object-oriented programming language? Well, you say person, and then you say dot, and then you say name. And because it's object-oriented, it's the object that comes first. Whenever you want to do something in OOP, you always have to start with the object. Object comes first, and then dot, and then the method, then the behavior. Whereas with this style, everything is other way around. We say, well, I'm going to pass the object last, because the object is the least important one. What is more important is the behavior. Behavior comes first, and then the object comes, comes after that. And this is really interesting in another, for another reason, because you actually have done this if you do any programming with a classical object-oriented language, like in, in Java, or even if you use classes in JavaScript. This is something that you have actually done all the time, but just in a slightly different, in a slightly different way. So here we have a class called auth service, which has a constructor which receives an endpoint, so we can do some HTTP requests, and then it has a method called login that takes username and and password, and does the fetch request, returns the promise, and doesn't really matter. And this is exactly the same idea. It's, it's just sort of repackaged in a slightly different way, because logically, here you also have two functions. You have the constructor function, which you call first, and then pass one bit of information, which is the endpoint. And then, sometime in the future, when you have more information, you pass the username and and the password. Yeah? So that's really interesting, because it's the same kind of idea, the same kind of principle, but it, it, it kind of feels really, really clumsy. Because first here, you're only limited. You only have two significant points, the time of construction and the time of method invocation in, 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 in OOP languages. Whereas if you use current functions, you can have as many as you like. You can just keep on adding arrows. And that's, I think, because Object-oriented programming was not discovered, it was invented. I think, I think that's a big difference between something being invented and something being discovered. Like, you know, Facebook and Twitter, they're not invented, they, they, sorry, they're not discovered, they are invented. We as a human race have invented um, Facebook, and we also invented 
object-oriented programming. But I think um, carrying and, and carried, fun ca carried functions, that is something that we discover. That's something that sort of exists. It's, it's a fact of nature, and it, it exists. Um, and that's a, that's a much nicer thing about this. And this is how we would do the same thing, but just with carried, carried functions. We have a one function called login, which is a carried function. First, it takes the endpoint, and then it takes the username and, and the password. Um, right. So let's have a look at a few more examples of this. Um, how, how we can use these carried functions. So here we can add a implement a function called add. We can add this add function to our list of molecules. And add function takes an A and then takes a B and then computes A plus B, but in this sort of curried way. It first takes an A and then it takes a B. Which is really useful because then we can get a function that increments number by one by only applying the add function onto number one. Because fp.add1 would as a result produce exactly this function here. The increment function itself. And we can do the same thing for less than, so fp.lt or less than is a curried function that takes a and b and returns true if b is smaller, smaller than a. So if we want a function that checks whether a number is negative, we just say fp.lt0 and we get a function that checks for negative numbers. We can push this idea even further and, and, and see what happens when we try and do the same thing with collections. So. How do we make this thing point-free? Well, first thing is, this is a solved problem. We've, we have just done this. So we can, we can get rid of this function, or a fat arrow, by replacing this with fp.pick age. So we're now down to, to one point from, from the two points. And then we need to understand here that there is a little bit of tension going on between the object-oriented programming style and this point-free or a functional style. Because if you look at this object-oriented code, it's the object that comes first. Like to, to do anything useful, you have to start with the object. But if you think about the point-free stuff, object is the thing that comes last. Because we initially know what do we want to pick. We want to pick the age. This is the first thing that we know. I know that I want to re retrieve a property called age, but I don't know from which collection. So we can then just implement another molecule called map, whose only purpose is to kind of swap the order of, of things. So rather than taking the object first and then the function that we use to do the mapping, we take the function first. We want the behavior first and object last. And then we take the object and then we just kind of repackage axis.map. F. Okay, so now that we have this molecule, then get ages can just be applied by, implemented by applying fp.map on fp.pick age and this people or persons, which again kills another cat, but we know what to do. We can just perform the eta reduction and get the point free version of get ages. So now we can do these manipulations with collections by only applying two functions. And this is a really interesting idea. Because what happens here is we have two general purpose functions, like pick and map. And then we manage to create a completely new function, which is specifically tailored for our use case by only applying these functions onto one another. So we first apply the pick on on the string age, take the result of that, and then apply fp.map on the result. And we magically, we just obtained another function from, from nothing, without using any function keywords or any, or any fat arrows. Um, how can we implement a function that gives us an array of names of all the people in the collection? Well, we just do fp.map, fp.pick, name. We can do the same thing with, with filter. So, for example, how could we find all the negative numbers in, in an array? Well, the first bit is easy. This is easy. We've already solved this problem. So we can say, find the negative is, is ns.filter fplt0, because this predicate here would only return true if the number is a negative number. And then we are left with this fat arrow here. 
What can we do? Well, exactly the same thing. We add the filter molecule to our collection of, of utilities because we need to reorder things and make sure that the behavior comes first, then the object, and then we compute the result. And then we apply filter on the FPLT0 and the collection that we want to filter. Again, another kitten dies, we do the eta, eta reduction and get this as a result, which is a point-free version of this function up, up here. Yeah. We can do the same thing with reduce. So reduce is another um, method that's commonly used on, on arrays. So for example, if we want to compute the sum of all the elements inside, inside an array, we can call reduce and add pass this reducer function that just adds two numbers together and start with number zero, and this would give us the sum of all the elements in, in an array. How do we do this point free? Well, we first create the molecule, fp.reduce, because we want to be able to reduce this, to, re to reuse this. The interesting thing about this one is, is this bit of code here, because we've noticed that most of the functions that we've implemented are curried functions. So rather than calling this function f, that the reducer function in a normal way, we would expect now that the reducer function itself is a curried is a curried function, because again most of our functions are going to be curried curried anyway. So a reduce method now expects a curried function, which means that the sum of all the numbers can now be computed like this. We just say fp reduce fp add zero. We start with zero, we keep adding numbers together, and we will get their sum. Again, all, all point free. And then we can do many other, other things using exactly the same idea. If we want to find the product of all the elements of the array, the only thing that we have to change is start with a different value. We need to start with number one. And we need to call fp.multiply which just multiplies the two numbers together. If we want to find if all the elements in, if, sorry, if at least one of the elements in an array of booleans is a true, we can do that by calling fp.reduce fp or false. We start with the false because that's the neutral value for the logical or, and use fp.or as a, as a reducer. Same for all, same for min, and same for max. So the only difference is the function that we pass and the initial value that we start with. And this is also another interesting thing. It's a kind of a side discovery because we, we nearly discovered something called semi-groups um, or monoid, monoids. So if um, you are, are so inclined, I, I suggest you look you look into this because it, it, it seems that like uh, some pattern here is is Im emerging. We have a function and then we have a neutral value for that operation. And then when we combine that using the reduce, then we can apply that function onto all the elements in a in a collection. Right. So this was good. We we, we managed to solve a lot of problems and the problems are getting more and more complex. But now we have a new kind of problem. So this is, this is really a, a, a tough one. We, we cannot actually solve this with the arsenal of functions that we have built so far. What we're trying to do is implement a function that given a person would give us back its balance. But the problem is balance is contained in another property of a person called account. So let's see how we can attack this problem. So first, we're going to make it more complicated in order to make it simpler. So I'm going to split this into two things. I'm going to split this into an invocation of the getAccount function, which we know how we can implement point free. That's, that's an easy thing. That's just pick, uh, pick account. And I will use the getBalance function, which I also know how to implement in a point free style. Let's just pick, pick balance. And then we notice here that we can actually implement this like that. So basically what happens here is you give it a person, and then we first apply the getAccount function on the person. 
capture the result and then pass that result as a parameter to the get balance, get balance function. And whatever that function returns as a result, that's what the get account balance returns as well. And then we can perform another weird looking refactoring step. So this, this, this might look a little bit esoteric. If you ever um, did immediately invoke anonymous functions that used to be all rage because that was the only way how you could have modules now you have the bundlers that, that do all that hard work for you but this was the kind of thing that you had to do yourself before. We can now extract this idea of applying a function onto a parameter and then applying another function on the result of that in this sort of expression here. We just sort of parameterize this get balance and get account uh, by applying them onto this this function here. So basically you give it two functions, f and g, and as a result you'll get a function that applies g on p and then f on g and p and returns that as a, as a result. Which then means we can just take this bit and put it in the R list of, of molecules. So now we have an abstraction that can help us solve this particular problem when we have functions applying, being applied on the results of the previous functions being being applied. And we call this thing compose. So compose is a, another function that takes two functions as parameters and returns a third function as a result that applies the first one on the result of the second one. And this is again really interesting because this is another thing that we have discovered. So this is not something we've invented. This is a fact of life. Like, you know, if, if, if you ever met an alien, they, they probably would not know what Facebook is and, and, and um, how you build classes in, in, in C++ because those, those things are invented. But I'm 100% sure that they would know what numbers are. They would know how to count, maybe not in the same way as us, but they would have some sort of abstraction for numbers and they would have functional composition. They, 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 they would have functions, they would have mappings be because that's, that's a fact of nature. It's not something that we, not something that we invented. And this sort of discovery of a functional composition is a really, really important one because what this allows you to do is to transform any sort of sequential problem where you take a parameter, apply one function on it, capture the result, pass that onto another function, capture the result, pass that onto another function, and so on, which is kind of similar to 99% of the programs that you, you write. So you, you were doing this all the time, you just did not spot and internalize the idea of a functional composition, because that's exactly how you mostly program. You just keep passing results of the previous computations onto the next ones, um, which can also be represented like, like this. Or it can be done by just saying fp.compose f4, f3, f2, f, f1 in a point-free point style. Okay, so now we have another useful molecule to solve different class of problems. And I'm just quickly going to recap this because um, you can get confused by, by these brackets in, in JavaScript. So if we have function f5 that does this, Notice how this x is sandwiched in, in the middle, like it's in, inside all these, all these brackets. Then we can replace this mechanically with fp.compose f4, f3, f2, f1. Okay? But if you have a situation like this one, so if you have x, arrow, and then these brackets are not nested with one another, they are just one after another with x being at the end, we know that this kills kittens, and we know that this can be reduced using the eta reduction to just, to just that. So these two transformations, they, 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 they look similar, but they're completely different because of how the brackets, how the brackets go. But we have these two rules to, to sort of work with. And now we can pretty much do the whole thing. So now it's just a matter of combining curried functions and functional composition to implement the solution of the original problem. So how can we implement a function that tells us whether a person is 
an adult. Well, we have to replace all these operators with functions first. So we can say is adult takes person and does fp not of fp.lt18 applied onto fp.peak age of person. And then if you kind of squint and replace all these fp not, fp.lt, fp.peak with f1, f2, and f3, you'll notice that this is exactly the functional composition. We pass the result of the previous function application as a parameter to the next, to the next function. So mechanically, we can replace this with fp.compose fp not, fplt, and fppeak h. Cool. How do we find out if the person is in debt, like if they owe money? Well, that's also easy because all we have to do is compose these three functions together. So we first pick the account. Be careful, you have to read this right to left. That's the order of, of application. So the one on the left would be applied last. The one on the right would be applied first. So we first pick the property called account of the person, then we pick the property called balance of that account, and then we check if it is less, less than zero. Yeah. Okay, so how can we then get an array of balances for all the people inside the collection? So this is now combining what we've done before with the functional composition. Well, it's also easy because all we have to do, we just have to pass FP compose, FP pick balance, and FP pick account. I need quotes around here to FP dot, dot map, and this would give us exactly this function, this function here. So we managed to kill both of these fat arrows. We managed to kill both of these points by applying FP dot map on the result of FP dot compose of these, these two functions here. How do we find all the adults in? in the array? Well, again, that's also easy. We do fp.filter. That's, that's a filtering. And what is the filter function? Well, it's fp compose of fp not, fplt18, and fp pick age. So we first retrieve the property called age, then we check if it's less than 18, and then we need to invert, invert that behavior. Right. Which now brings us to kind of putting all of this together and checking out the final result. So this was the point full version of this little program. And the point free version would look like this. So it's one big compose, and then let's read it bottom to top or right to left. So we first filter um, people that are adults. Then we filter out the ones that are in, in that, from all that list of adults. Then we get the balances, or account balances. And then we reduce that by using subtraction as the reducer function, and starting with the value, with the value of 0. Okay? And you can actually see that this would give you the same, same result. So here we have this array of people, person 1 to person 5, and um, the adults owe 6. And we can see that, I'm not sure whether you can see the 6 here. Yeah, you can. Um, so the point free version produces exactly the same result as the, as the, point, full, as the point full one. Um, We have some time, some time left, so it might be worth playing with this and exploring some other, some other ideas. So what potentially might not be the nicest thing about this solution is that we filter twice. We create this intermediate array of filtered values where we could actually perform this filtering um, all, all at once. And the way we can do this is we can use this molecule called both. So both is a function that takes two functions as parameters and gives you back another function that would only return true if both of these two functions return, return true. So now we can change this and replace it with 
fp dot filter and then we do fp dot both and give it these two filter functions all right and if i got the the brackets together we still get the number the number 6 as a result and this was like a really simple example of something that should look and feel very familiar. We sort of manipulated our program the same way we manipulate expressions or equations. So I remember when you were a child and you were taught maths and when you say x plus 7 equals 17 and they then teach you the rule that says well, if you have 7 on the left-hand side, you can subtract it from both sides and then get that x equals 17 minus 7, which means that x is equal to 10. You have a certain rules that allow you to transform equations while preserving the kind of meaning of them and, 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 their, and their semantics. And that's exactly what, what we, we, can do, we can do here as well. We can have some rules that allow us to swap code for one another and be certain that we're not changing the behavior or, uh, of, our, of our code. Another useful thing we might, we might try is something like this, because it can be quite tricky to understand what's going on inside all these point-free functions, and it might be hard to, to debug them. So we may introduce another molecule, and let's call it log. And log works like, like this. It takes an x. It then logs it, and then returns x as a, as a result. And let's do stringify here, because it'd be easier to, to see. Um, and then also, let's add name. Let's make it a curried function, and put name. And then what we can do with this, we can then say, well, I'm going to log fp.log after filter. Okay? And here I can say fp.log after map. And then I'll have to run this in the Chrome DevTools. And then we can see all these intermediate results as they flow through this compositional pipeline. We can see that when we invoked our function, this was the state of the result after the, the filter was applied, and then this was the state after the map was applied. We have minus 2 and minus 4, and this is the final result, which is, which is minus 6. If we were to try and do the same thing with, with this implementation, that would be much, much trickier because this is implemented in this sort of mix between OOP and, and the functional style. So we would have to do something like this if we would want to insert something non-invasively in, in this computation. We'd have to say array.prototype.log, and that's a function that takes, let's say, a name. And then it logs the name and... Uh, this, and then returns this, and then we can here say log after filter one, and then log after filter two, and log after map. Let's see if that works. Okay, it does, and we we get we get the same, the same thing. So we get minus 2, minus 4, mi minus 4 after map, then we get this after the filter 2, which is the same as, as here, because we managed to join these two together in a point-free implementation. And then after the first filter, we only got the ones that were, under, that, that were adults. But this is not very nice, because we are mutating this global array.prototype, which we shouldn't be doing, but that was pretty much the only way how we could non-invasively non-invasively, add this little bit of login and inspect these intermediate 
results, which was much nicer and neater um, and easier to do with the point free with a point free version. We didn't have to mutate any global objects or, or introduce any any functions anywhere else. Right. So to recap, what did we discover while while we did all this? Like on this journey to try and implement as much of our program without having name parameters and, and, and the function keyword. Well, first we discovered the ethyl reduction. We, we discovered one means of removing, one of the means of removing the pointless code, basically removing unnecessary indirection in, in your code and making the co code much simpler and making the code communicate what's, what's actually happening in a, much, in a much nicer way. So there was one thing that we discovered. Um, the other thing that we discovered was curried functions. We discovered that you can implement everything by only using functions that take one parameter at a time. And we've seen that these functions actually do something that you as developers do all the time. They allow you to take something that's more complex and more flexible, for example, a function that adds two numbers together, and then automatically, for free, from that get something that's simpler. Basically, a function that adds one to any number that you pass in as a parameter, a function that increments number by, by one. So it, it's, it's, it, it's a means of going from something that's more complex to something that's more, more simple. And finally, we discovered the functional composition, which is one of the means of creating new functions from existing functions. And this is sort of the other way around. So this is going in the other direction. You start with few things that are simpler, but then you combine them and create something that's more powerful, something that's more complex um, than the parts that you constructed it, constructed it from. Right. Well, I hope this gave you some ideas for some of your own investigation and some of the things to try to try on your own um, in terms of you know practical practicalities and when 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 would you do this um, there are plenty of existing libraries that use and rely on this this style of code if you ever used Ramda um, all Ramda or most of the Ramda functions would be curried functions and you can practice point free style by by using Ramda. Also, new version or latest version of RxJS, so if you use Angular or, or, or do any reactive programming with RxJS, um, is starting to favor functional composition rather than this object-oriented style where all these methods are defined as the methods on the observable object. We now just have a pure functions that operate on, on observables. So um, it seemed like a weird, really sort of weird way of doing things, but uh, we discovered some really cool facts and cool things on the journey while we tried to solve a very, very concrete problem. So um, thanks a lot for coming, and I wish you all the best.